Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I thought I'd have a go at ranking the um, the Pink Floyd albums. I know a few people have tried to do this over the years, or have done this successfully, or it's all a matter of opinion, of course. James Griffiths, James Griffiths, I remember watching yours. Uh, just worth saying up front, as I always say, my views are probably not going to reflect yours in some cases, maybe even in many cases. Uh, and that's okay, perfectly okay. It's just my opinion, okay? And I have some quite strong feelings when it comes to Pink Floyd. I like a lot of it, and I'm not quite so keen on other bits. Um, 15 albums here to rank. By the way, this Ultimate Music Guide, uh, an excellent series of, of um, talked about it before it um, you know reviews every album with giving marks out of five to each track and uh, on the whole well written uh, if inevitably one doesn't agree with the conclusions um, but it was nice to see some albums which don't normally get a good review well reviewed in that album but they also stick up for some of the dodgier ones so at number 15 I've put The Endless River, which was put out a few years ago by Gilmore. Uh, Rick Wright died a few years ago, and this is basically outtakes from the Division Bell sessions, largely instrumental and a bit difficult to listen to all the way through. It's more like background stuff, really. Uh, in my opinion, it doesn't really qualify as a proper bona fide Pink Floyd album, but it was released as, as such and probably sold on that basis. But uh, maybe it should have been like a bonus disc on a, on a deluxe version of Division Bell. Well, maybe it was released that way as well. But anyway, as a standalone album, it's uh, pretty forgettable. And I don't believe I've listened to it more than once all the way through, dipped into it. Uh, there's one vocal on it from Gilmore. Uh, that was number 15. Then number 14, got this Amagama album from 69. Well, there's an okay live side with some some of the early tracks, but there's a pretty forgettable um, studio side. So, you know, the live side's okay, but the studio side is very self-indulgent, and a lot of the early Floyd is self-indulgent, but this one is a bit over the top in that respect, in my opinion. Uh, then we've got more, number 13. This is a soundtrack from a film, and it sounds sounds like it was put together in a bit of a hurry. It's inoffensive music. Uh, we've got some tracks like the Nile song, which is kind of trying to be a rocker. I notice a lot of these songs are written by Waters on side one in particular, and then side two is, is largely a group effort, with, with the exception of the, a Spanish piece, the guitar bit, uh, towards the end. Um, never really escalates into anything more than a soundtrack. and. Uh, doesn't really work without, well I haven't actually watched the film so I'm not sure how it works in conjunction with the film, but as a standalone album it doesn't, it's not very successful. Um, number 12 we've got Momentary Lapse of Reason and Gilmore kept the band going after Roger left which I had a hard time with. Um, I'm not saying Gilmore and Mason with right in helping here uh, didn't have a chemistry between them, they probably worked well and probably glad that Roger wasn't with them but Pink Floyd lost virtually all of their lyrical capability and a lot of their artistic direction when Roger left and I'm not sure I know financially speaking why they kept going but artistically speaking they weren't valid Pink Floyd in my opinion after Roger left certainly with that first album Number 11, I've got Source Full of Secrets, which is their second album. A lot of people are going to be upset that this album's so low. It's okay. It's got some interesting stuff on it, like Set the Controls to the Heart of the Sun. It's even got a Sid Barrett song at the end. Uh, the title track is very long and quite tedious, really, uh, I'm afraid. Um, and this album never really has done that much for me. Although I did re-listen to all of these albums in preparation to, for this review, and it's a little better than I remembered. Um, number 10, I've got The Division Bell, which, uh, this is a double album. I mean, it came out as a single CD at the time, and it was basically an hour long. And again, I quite enjoyed re-listening to this. Uh, there's some decent guitar work, 
and uh, it's, it's inevitably too long, um, in my opinion. Well, having said that, not all double albums are too long, but this one uh, is a little bit lengthy, in, and str one struggles to listen to it all the way through, although my son Richie really loves it, and he keeps on trying to get me into it. And uh, there's some great guitar work on it, and some good vocals. Uh, there's even a track mentioning um, how he tried to make Roger and make peace with Roger and Roger told him to go himself uh, so that's a bit unpleasant but uh, interesting so that was number 10 slightly more legitimate Pink Floyd effort versus the momentary lapse of reason a momentary lapse of reason number nine we have medal for 71 which a lot of people have with their near the top of their list uh, good gatefold picture um, one of these days was done brilliantly in concert from by Roger couple of years ago when, when we saw him. Uh, Echoes is a good track although inevitably a bit long taking up the whole of side two um, but we've got some great tracks on it on here as well like um, the Gilmore track Fearless uh, is a standout and St Trope is quite an amusing Roger track. Early in Roger's career he was writing these jaunty tunes <laughs> which are quite out of character for him compared to what he was going to do later. Um, but that's quite interesting. So that was number nine, medal. Number eight, Atom Heart Mother. I really think this should have been the front cover. What do you guys think? Um, I, re re I really enjoyed listening to this the other day. Never really got into this album uh, up until this last listen, really, although the title track had its moments. It's quite long, but it's quite moving, and it's got some good horn arrangements on it. And, uh, yeah, I like um, the track If, which is a Roger song. And uh, Fat Old Son from Gilmore is good. Even Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast is quite interesting, because it doesn't go on too long. Um, so this... Yeah, I think it's the best of their early stuff, with the exception of the uh, of the first one, which is next in my list, number seven. I have Sid Barrett's dominated first album, A Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and uh, again, really enjoyed re listening to this the other day. Some wacky stuff on here. Um, actually, I really enjoy Sid Barrett's two solo albums as well, but they're not Pink Floyd, so I didn't include them in the rankings, but they would probably be even higher than this this album, if anything, particularly Madcap Laughs. Uh, but yeah, this has got some great great stuff on it. Um, not so much in, Interstellar Overdrive, it's not my favourite, um, but some of the Barrett, some of the, um, the Barrett solo, solo written songs are really quite quite moving and quite innovative. Um, tracks like The Gnome and The Scarecrow and Bike at the end is hilarious uh, and a great song. So that was number seven. And then we've got the final cut at number six. This is uh, the last album they did with Roger Waters. According to Dave Gilmore, it should have been called The Final Straw. The band were not getting on at all and they were being used, they said, as session musicians for Roger with all his anti-war lyrics. But this is more than a Roger Waters solo album, as people often call it. It's a Pink Floyd album. Gilmore produces some beautiful guitar on it. Nick Mason's on form on the drums, apart from one track where Andy Newmark plays. So if people want to call it a solo album, I think they're wrong, because I think Gilmore, even though perhaps reluctantly, he, com he contributes a lot to this album. And uh, lyrically, although I, politically I don't, always or even often agree with some of what Roger's singing about. I bought this album when it first came out. That was the only Pink Floyd album I bought on the day of release. And uh, I was 18 and I uh, was really impressed with some of these songs like Paranoid Eyes and The Post-War Dream, Get Your Filthy Hands Off My Desert. Um, Southampton Dock, I think, is an outstanding track and one of the best anti-war songs ever written. Again, I think successful because it's not pointing the finger at individuals, it's just talking about the the ladies or the mothers waiting for the ships to come back from war. And instead of the sons returning home uh, happily, the, the, the ship is carrying the, the coffins of the dead sons uh, by implication, so it's very sad. 
and one of Roger's finest moments of his entire career, Southampton Dock. And the other track, which I think is really worthy of mention, is Two Sons in the Sunset at the end, uh, about nuclear holocaust and how the sun is in the east. Even though the day is done, Two Sets in the Sunset could be the human race's run. Um, I think it's great lyrics, good drumming from Andy Newmark, good sentiment. And, uh, you know, who, is, who isn't anti-nuclear war at the end of the day? So that was a more palatable Roger lyric than some of the ones he's written. That's number six. Number five, I got Obscured by Clouds. I really got into this album in the last couple of years. Wasn't too fond of it before or knew it that well, but uh, my God, is it a good album. And one can see it's almost a template for what followed with Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, there's some brilliant stuff on here. Uh, the title track in particular... In fact, the whole of side one is just fantastic. The whole album is pretty damn consistent with the, maybe the exception of Absolutely Curtains at the end, which is not quite up to the same level, but I'm nitpicking because when that album is good, which is good for 75% of the time, it is just classic Floyd. Mostly sung by Gilmore, I noticed, um, and some great musicianship. Number four, I've got Dark Side of the Moon. Well, it's not higher on the list because of the three which are above it and it's a bit like when people do lists of the Beatles they don't often put Sgt Pepper at the top these days um, it's objectively speaking perhaps the best Pink Floyd record certainly the one they used to play in the uh, the hi-fi shops when you bought your amp or your speakers back in the back in the day um, it's, it's got some groundbreaking sound effects and the great gig in the sky is just a superb instrumental with that great vocal female vocal from Claire Torrey and we've got uh, us and them just sublime time breathe uh, eclipse brain damage fantastic number two number three I've got wish you were here which uh, not only is a great album but great packaging as well with this superb inside the black plastic this is another copy I had where I lost the black plastic. And uh, in fact, I've got it in here. <laughs> um, so that it comes with that and this on the back and then the, with these superb postcards inside. Actually, I'm not sure if I can show you if I have them here. Um, have I got them? Lost the postcard. Here it is. Brilliant shot there. I think a lot of this is designed by Hypnosis, the famous record album cover design people. And Wish You Were Here contains that beautiful tribute to Sid Barrett, Shine On You Crazy Diamond. Title track Wish You Were Here is just fantastic. Um, have a Cigar, for some reason Roger Waters gave it to um, Roy Harper to sing. Don't know why he didn't sing it himself, I think he regrets it now. Um, anyway, Roy Harper does a good job. Number two, I've got Animals from 77. Uh, some people think that Roger took over the band musically a bit too much for their liking. Well, he certainly did lyrically, but I think musically, Gilmore and Waters are working extremely well on this album, although Gilmore only sings on Dogs for half of Dogs, and Roger's singing lead on the rest. Uh, Gilmore's guitar work on this album, and even Rick Wright's um, keyboard work is, is outstanding. And uh, I... This album is actually ranking, almost could have been put number one, and I did consider it putting it number one, but then I had to put the wall at number one because I think at the end of the day, it's always gonna be my favorite. I bought it fairly soon after it came out. I've loved it to bits then and ever since. Uh, not just for the single or for Comfortably Numb, the well-known tracks, um, you know, which would include Mother, fantastic track. Um, but also that some of the hidden gems like Goodbye Blue Sky and Hey You uh, In the Flesh Run Like Hell um, The Thin Ice Young Lust uh, Goodbye Cruel Worlds uh, there's very little padding on this album one could say a little bit of Side 3 with Vera Lynn and Bring, you, bring the Boys Back Home but that's that's really nitpicking because it hardly lo loses steam throughout the album. And, he, and side four is very dramatic with the trial song and um, the show must go on and outside the wall at the end. I think it's a perfect concept album. The film that came with it, or a couple of years later, was also very moving with Bob Gildoff in the lead role as Pink. 
Uh, they did it live in Earl's Court in 1881. Roger did it live on his own with, a, with, get, with backing people like Sinead O'Connor and Van Morrison in, in Berlin in 1990. And he's done it several times. I've seen it in Budapest, him do it, the wall in Budapest live, the whole album from start to finish. So that was the wall. It'll always be my favorite. And this, this is my Pink Floyd album rankings, just my opinion from 15 up to one there. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. See you next time.